Question one, RBT should prepare for their session prior to arriving at the client's home, clinic, or place of work. Which of the following answer choices is not typically part of preparing for session? Very beginning of our task list, we talk about data collection and we talk about preparing for session. It's important to be prepared for session so that when you arrive, you can immediately start implementing the plan. We shouldn't be getting to session and then preparing. Preparation happens before, implementation happens during. So what does the question want to know? The question wants to know what is not typically part of preparing for session, meaning that three of these will be part of preparing for session. Don't forget to read your questions carefully and watch out for that not word. So let's find the one that is not part of preparing for session. A, read session notes from any sessions that happened in between your last session. For example, if you're on a team of RBTs and you need to know what happened when you weren't there, reading session notes, it's a great way to do it. You should be taking session notes every session. It's a great way to communicate to the team what happened at your session. Absolutely part of preparing for your own session. B, gather all required materials needed for data collection. Of course, you should come prepared. If you need a stopwatch, if you need a tablet, if you need pen and paper, whatever you need, gather before your session. So again, when you're there, you arrive ready to go. C, consult with the parents once you arrive at session on any changes they would like to make to the treatment plan. Is it the RBT's job to consult with the parents and make changes to the treatment plan? No, that is the supervisor's job. Now, if the parent comes to you and says, I would like to add this, I would like to change this, totally fine. Communicate with that, communicate that to your supervisor and you'll go from there. But part of preparing for session is not getting to session and during session, talking with the parent about what they would like to change. Remember, when they talk about preparing for session, we're talking about before session. And then D, gather any reinforcers you might use in bringing to the session. Just like B, gathering materials, gathering reinforcers, Whatever you need, have ready to go. Our answer is going to be C. On the exam, if they ask you about preparing for session, just think about what am I going to do before I arrive? Question two. This type of assessment is the least effective at identifying antecedents, consequences, and the function of behaviors. When we talk about least effective as far as assessments go, we kind of have a hierarchy of effective assessments. Now, all the assessments have their place. Some are just better at others than identifying specific consequences, functions, behaviors, and antecedents. What's the most powerful assessment? Well, that's going to be a functional analysis. Now, any assessment where you're directly observing the client is going to be better than an indirect assessment for obvious reasons. If you're watching the client with your own eyes, that's better than getting a secondhand opinion on what that client does or doesn't do. So with that in mind, the question wants to know what assessment is least effective at identifying antecedents, consequences, and the functions of behaviors. So if we're attacking this question, the first thing we're thinking is, well, the least effective way would be an indirect assessment. If that's not an option, we'll move to some sort of a direct assessment. And then finally, the functional analysis. But what do we have? We actually do have indirect assessment. Indirect assessment is going to definitely be less effective than a functional analysis and a direct assessment. And then event recording is a type of direct assessment, right? Where we're taking data on every time something occurs. So pretty straightforward question. The type of assessment that is least effective at identifying antecedents, consequences, and the function is an indirect assessment because we're not actually observing the client. Three. During your most recent session with your client, you notice that your client will scratch himself when asked to complete a math assignment. You tell your BCBA that you think the client wants to escape from homework. The BCBA asks you what the scratching looks like. The BCBA wants to know what. Okay, let's attack the question. What is the question asking? They want to know what the BCBA wants to know. So what does the question tell you about that? Well, the BCBA says or asks you, what does the scratching look like? And when your supervisor and when the BCBA wants to know what something looks like, that refers to what? Is that the function? Well, the function is why it's happening. 
the BCBA had asked, why did this behavior occur? That would be the function. What the BCBA asked what? They asked, what does it look like? So if we look at B, the topography, that's more of what we're looking for. The topography describes what the behavior looks like. Both function and topography are important parts of behavioral definitions. But this question wants to know, when the BCBA asks you what the scratching looks like, they want to know about the topography. We have the magnitude. So that would be like the intensity, how uh, intense the scratching is. Does it leave marks? The magnitude typically refers to things like um, loud or soft, hard or soft, right? Big or small. That's magnitude. Different than what it looks like. The topography is going to say something like the client takes their hand and drags their nails on their skin. That's specifically how the behavior looks. If you added magnitude, it would be the client takes their nails and drags their nails on their skin hard. Hard would be the magnitude. That's an important distinction. Now, as an RBT, you're really going to be worried about function and topography. But just be aware that magnitude is also involved in some cases. But if we're ever asking what a behavior looks like, we're really concerned about the topography. And of course, the antecedent is just what happened before um, the scratching occurs. But that's not what the BCBA is concerned with. Answer the question. And if you answer this question, it's very simple. What does the BCBA want to know? The BCBA wants to know what the scratching looks like. The BCBA wants to know the topography. Sarah practices a standing backflip every day at cheer camp. She practices on a soft mat and will flip into a foam pit. When Sarah returns home from cheer camp, she shows her parents that she learned how to do a backflip. Sarah is demonstrating what? All right, this is great. This is what we're trying to achieve, right? When we teach things to our clients, we don't want just we don't want them to just be able to do it in our presence. We want them to be able to do it at school and at home, okay? It doesn't do us any good if we teach something, and then when their parents want to see it done, they can't do it. In this case, however, Sarah was able to do it, right? She learned how to do a standing backflip. She came home, and she shows them how to do a backflip. What is occurring? Okay, This is what we're doing when we're attacking the question. We're not even worried about the answer choices yet. We're reading this question, and we're attacking it. We're gathering all the information and forming our own opinion, our own prediction, before we even get to answer choices. So what are we predicting? Well, if Sarah learned the backflip at cheer camp, and then she goes home and can do the backflip, she's doing the behavior outside the learning environment. That describes generalization. And if we look at A, there's our answer, generalization. Okay, All your work should be done up front. Attack, attack, attack. Extinction. Sarah is not demonstrating extinction. She is not withholding reinforcement. Spontaneous recovery is a symptom of extinction. Once a behavior is on extinction, but this question has nothing to do with extinction. Don't even worry about it. And then response generalization is what? When multiple responses occur for one stimulus, it is not response generalization. Okay. It's performing this backflip at cheer camp and then going home and performing the backflip at home. It's the same response. Sarah is simply demonstrating generalization. Whenever Mike studies for the RBT exam, he studies for 20 minutes straight and then takes a five-minute break before studying again for 20 minutes. What is the IRT for studying behavior? Okay. Really simple question, right? Very simple. What is inter-response time? Inter-response time is the time between two responses. In this case, what is our response? Well, studying, right? And we're looking at studying behavior. We have two instances of that response. Studies for 20 minutes straight. Five minutes pass. Start studying again. What is the IRT? Five minutes. Yes, that question is very easy. A lot of the questions on the RBT exam might be very easy. The key is trust your preparation and don't overthink it. Answer the question to the best of your ability. Move on. Which of the following is not an antecedent to the behavior? Okay. What this is and how sometimes they will word questions, they're not going to explicitly really ask you for a definition straight up, but what they'll, what they'll do is they'll test your knowledge of definitions. And in this case, you need to know what an antecedent is to answer this question. So what is an antecedent? Let's attack the question. An antecedent is something that happens 
before the behavior or before the response. So if the question is asking about what is not an antecedent, well, it's going to be whatever answer choice doesn't happen before the response. Knowing that, we can go to the answer choices and answer this pretty easily. Does an SD happen before the response? Absolutely. The SD is kind of the instruction or the cue, right? Prompt. Well, the prompt is just a temporary SD, okay? It also signals behavior to happen. It is an antecedent. And then extinction, does extinction happen before or after? Well, extinction happens after the behavior, right? When we're putting behavior on extinction, the response occurs, and then we implement extinction. Extinction is a consequence. Extinction looks like our answer. What about D? Motivating operation. Is the motivating operation an antecedent or a consequence? Well, an MO comes before an SD, which comes before a prompt. Therefore, it has to be an antecedent. Our best answer here is going to be C, extinction. Again, if you know your terminology and you're fluent, you're going to be very good at the exam, okay? That should be your number one priority when you first start studying. Become as fluent as possible. You'll be surprised at how easy the questions can become. All right, moving on. Glenn finally gets the courage to ask his crush, Sydney, out on a date. Sydney tells him she would love to go out with him. After their date, Glenn asks Sydney for another date. Glenn's behavior was changed due to what? What changes behavior? Well, typically reinforcement and punishment. What does reinforcement do? Increases. What does punishment do? Decreases. Those words positive and negative, what do they mean to us? Positive, we're adding something. Okay. Negative, we're taking something away. And that's how we attack reinforcement punishment questions. Glenn's behavior, okay, asking out his crush. What was the consequence of that? Well, Sydney said yes. Okay. Sydney went out with them, on and on. So what does what does Glenn do? He asked Sydney again out. He asked for another date. Did Glenn's behavior increase or decrease? What well, increased, right? Or at least maintained. So is it reinforcement or punishment? It's going to be reinforcement. And then when Glenn asked her out, did she add something or take something away? Well, she gave him that response. She added the yes. They went on a date. Everything was great, right? We're looking at a positive consequence, right? So we have reinforcement, which increased, and it's positive. Glenn's behavior was changed due to positive reinforcement. Again, if we attack the question like this, if we break it down, break it down, break it down, well, we won't miss these questions. And it might feel slow at first, but once you get good at it, you can do that very, very quickly, okay? Speed comes with knowledge. Speed comes with fluency. Speed comes with practice. We're not going to be fast in the beginning, and that's okay. But the more we practice, the more we work, the faster we're going to get. Which of the following measurement choices does not require you to be there to observe the behavior occur? Okay, now one specific type of measurement should be coming to mind. What measurement does not require you to be there to observe the behavior? And if we're not there to observe the behavior, then we're really concerned with what? Or we're concerned with the outcome. So what type of measurement is concerned with the outcome of the behavior? Is that discontinuous measurement? Well, discontinuous measurement doesn't capture every instance of behavior, but we still are required there to be there to observe the times we are measuring. Continuous measurement, of course, you have to be there to observe because you're capturing all instances of behavior. Direct measurement would be observation, right? So it leaves us with permanent product. What does permanent product do? We're going to measure the outcome or what the product of the behavior was. Do you need to be there to observe the behavior occur? No, you just need to see what happened once that behavior did occur. So an important takeaway is if you're going to use permanent product, make sure that behavior is producing something. If it's not, you might want to choose a different measurement style. Norma is instructed to use whole interval recording to track John's on-task behavior. When will Norma record a response? Okay, what is happening in this question? It's a great thing to start asking yourself. What is happening? What am I answering? What is, what is happening? So what are we answering? We are answering, when will Norma record a response? So we need to figure out when is measure, what, what, how is Norma measuring, right? So what is happening in this question? 
Norma is using whole interval recording. Does John's on-task behavior matter? Nope, not necessarily. We're really just for worried about the type of measurement, okay? Because we want to know when will Norma record a response. Well, if she's using whole interval recording, then when is she going to record a response? When that behavior occurs during the entire interval. That's what whole interval is. Now we've attacked the question where you have a good idea of what the answer is going to be. Can we find it? A, whenever the behavior occurs, is Norma just going to record a response every time the behavior occurs? No, she's using whole interval. That behavior has to occur throughout the entire interval for it to count as a response. B, if the behavior occurs during the interval. Now, the behavior, of course, needs to occur during the interval, but not just at any point. It needs to occur the whole time. So C, if the behavior occurs during the entire interval, okay, is what whole interval data is going to take as a behavior. B is more closely related to partial interval. And then D, if the behavior occurs at the inter end of the interval, that's more related to momentary time sampling. If we're using whole interval recording, normal real record a response if the behavior occurs during the entire interval. And then finally, your client is brand new and has a very limited repertoire of skills. You're working on basic things like imitation, matching, and labeling, but your client is making a lot of mistakes. What type of prompting might be best to limit mistakes? Think about what we're doing. Are we worried about prompt dependency? Are we worried about fading prompts? Or are we worried about almost errorless teaching, right? If we want to limit mistakes, that's on the verge of errorless teaching. We're trying to introduce more prompting. So what type of prompting might be best to limit mistakes? And this is why you need to be careful when you're reading questions. Because when people think prompting, we're always thinking prompt fading, use the least intrusive prompt. This question is going the other way. We're trying to find a more intrusive prompt to limit mistakes. So what type of prompting should we use? Should we use least to most? Well, least to most is going to be using the least intrusive prompt first. But we've already been working on this, and we're trying to limit mistakes. Okay, So if we want to limit mistakes, we're going to need to be using an intrusive prompt. So we're, we're already set on using prompts. Most to least is going to be better than least to most. Okay, Because most to least, we can start full physical and go from there. Right, Least to most, we're going to have to see, okay, what's the least amount of prompting we can get away with? If all we're concerned about is limiting mistakes, using most to least makes more sense because we can just start using some physical prompting. Verbal prompting is going to be less intrusive, okay, than physical prompting or modeling, right? And if our client's making a lot of mistakes, verbal might not be good enough. And then D, the prompt that is least intrusive, of course, we're not looking for the least intrusive prompt. We're looking for the prompt that is going to limit mistakes. We're going to start with the most intrusive prompt, the most powerful prompt, right, to limit mistakes. We're going to use most to least prompting. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe. Check out rbtexamreview.com. Questions, comments, let me know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.